What happens when you take a deep breath? Feel how the air enters your nose and goes to the back of your throat and then glides down through your larynx to the windpipe or trachea. As the air passes beyond the trachea, it goes into the bronchi and then into each lung and fills your chest. Marcus Aurelius was a philosopher that became Roman emperor. To him, to breathe was to be alive. With every moment, we would breathe out and suck in life. But imagine what it'd be like if you couldn't breathe out and could only have very shallow breaths. For people with tracheobronchomalacia, they're never able to take deep breaths, but only shallow breaths. And sometimes they have trouble breathing at all. And for the worst cases, if there's no one to breathe for them, then they will die. These are some pictures of individuals that have tracheobronchomalacia and some quotes from their parents about what it's like. It's hard and exhausting laying in your bed, needing sleep, wanting sleep, but you're too scared to go to sleep because you can't hear your child if you stop breathing while you are asleep. In an instant, the mood can go from hilarious and joyful to panic. He looks at me with a panic look in his face like, Mommy, help me, but all I can do is wait for him to calm down. It's horrible to have to keep your child from laughing. When your child wakes up in the middle of the night, red face, gasping for breath and coughing, tears streaming down his face, as a parent, you just want to fix it. But to know there is nothing I can do to truly fix it, it makes my heart ache. And as a physician, there was nothing that I could do to fix this either. My daughter said, why are you showing a picture of somebody dressed up as Robin? And the reason for this is this is how this boy had to spend Halloween. And if you look above his head, you'll see a balloon. That balloon was there so that if he stopped breathing, somebody could come in and breathe for him. These are two of the worst children that I saw with tracheomalacia. She could stop breathing at any moment. Every cough, every sniffle scares us. And the mother of Kaiba G and Frito, we were told that we should get prepared to bury our little man. This boy, even though he had a breathing tube in, was unable to breathe for himself even though he was given sedatives and narcotics and even paralyzed from time to time, he was unable to breathe. A colleague asked me, what would you do if you could do anything that you wanted? And I said, I'd want to try to find a cure for tracheomalacia. And she said, I know the person for you to talk to. And that person was Scott Hollister. So when Glenn and I got together for the first time, we had been working in our laboratory uh, on the use of 3D printing for making materials and implants. Now, a lot of you may have heard 3D, about 3D printing in the last year or so. It's gotten a lot of press. People have printed guns with it. We were hoping to use it for a more positive purpose uh, in our laboratory. So I just want to sort of step back and tell you what 3D printing is about. There are a couple ways you can do it. Some are laser-based sim systems, as you see in the upper left. Some are nozzle-based systems. You may have seen these again in the news. Uh, this is basically how the system works in our laboratory. It's a laser-based system. You spread powder across a bed. The laser come do comes down and, and essentially melts the, the particles together. Um, and using that, you can build up 3D structures a layer by a layer at a time. And this shows our laboratory. You can actually build up many structures at once. This is a material that we use called polycaprolactone. It's a biomaterial. You'll see the arm sweeping across more material across the uh, build area. And then it's difficult to see, but the laser beam will come down. It'll essentially melt all those particles together, and you'll see another uh, sweep of the material. And that's how we use three-dimensional printing to build biomaterials and implants. Of course, to build these things, you have to have the design to put into the machine, right? And if you work in the automotive industry or you work in aerospace, you have CAD files. We don't really have any CAD files or computer-aided design files for the human body. What we have are images that we can get from CT scans or MRI scans. And actually, Glenn himself volunteered to get a scan done of him, so we're going to show you some designs we make from uh, his scan. Um, and we can do things like rotate him around. <laughs> Uh, once we build a 3D model of him, we can rotate him upside down. I don't know if he can do that here on stage. 
But then if he needs new ears or nose, you know, we can take those off the model uh, and then we can design replacements that exactly match the anatomy of his ears and nose. And then we can peel back his skin and if he has issues with his skeleton or his trachea, as you see here, and you'll see a, a minute we see defects uh, in his jaw or defects in his skull, we can design pieces to fit those exactly. And we can even design, uh, you'll see the red piece on his trachea there, that's a splint to keep the trachea open. So you can see that this is really, in some sense, ushering in a new era of medicine, what we call, and what the FDA calls, the era of personalized medicine. Because we can take your own image data, we can design personalized implants for you from that image data, and we can build those on a three-dimensional printer. So like for the baby at the right who has malformation in his ear, we can design a new ear from actually his other side, the good side, and build that, and then we can test regeneration where here we're actually uh, growing a human ear on the back of a pig. But that's the, really the next point in this revolution is not only building the plastic parts, but regenerating tissue on top of those parts. And these materials are resorbable, so they will go away and you'll be left with the natural tissue. So again, from the starting point, we take the image, we create a 3D model like the ear, and then this is the reason we designed the holes in the structure, why it has pores in it, because once we build it, as you see in uh, the white structure on the bottom, we're gonna fill that structure with your own cells or perhaps even genes. Uh, you can see in the middle panel there, there's sort of a glistening uh, gel covering that ear, and those are cells we've actually uh, seeded into that structure, and then you can implant it under the skin to regrow the normal ear cartilage. So what this will also usher in is a way that you don't have to be in a medical center, even if you're out in space, once we have your image and design, we can send it out in space, and if you're flying around on the International Space Station with a 3D printer, you can print the body part right there. In fact, NASA is doing it right now. This is a picture of a test they're doing in one of their zero-G simulators to show that you can still do 3D printing in zero-G. In fact, we uh, have uh, sort of prototyped this, this concept by getting in this example, there was a patient from Milan, Italy, uh, who as you see in the, in the yellow bar uh, at the top, had periodontal disease and had some resorption of the bone and the soft tissue around the tooth. We get an image shipped to us over the net from Milan, Italy. Uh, that's in the middle panel. You can see the defect around the bone. And then we can design this three-dimensional scaffolding for that patient's image. We can, in this case, build it, ship it back to Milan. They're in the operating room there. And then you can see the patient about eight days and, and six months uh, after surgery. So in terms of what Glenn and I worked on, this was the patient that he mentioned, Kaiba. We did the same process. We got a three-dimensional CAT scan uh, of the child. And you can see his, his uh, trachea and his bronchi in the green there. And you can actually see the discontinuity or the break in the segment. So you can see when Kaiba tried to breathe out, his left bronchus actually collapsed. So then we can go ahead and design this biomaterial splint. We can fit it onto a digital representation of the patient before surgery. And then what we can do is we can actually build the actual trachea uh, for Glenn and other surgeons to take in the operating room. And you can see that in the operating room uh, with the splint. This was perfect. The model was exactly what we were hoping for. We were able to practice surgery, and we went to the operating room. When we opened up Kaiba's chest, the defect was exactly what we'd seen with the CAT scan, and we were fully prepared to do the operation. We put the splint on his airway. It fit perfectly, and instantly his lungs were able to move for the first time, and he was able to breathe. We knew that he would be okay. This is Kaiba two years later. He's now able to do all the things <laughs> that you would hope for a boy. He's able to play with his dog, have a happy birthday and have lots of birthday cake and enjoy his scooter. And he's no longer the child that was in the unit with the worried mom behind him. We'd like to close with the counsel of Marcus Aurelius. When you wake in the morning, think what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, and to love. Thank you.